Well, so we are now ready to solve the problem. We have to solve, we see now in, uh, in, uh, in the problems, we see now that we have to solve a partial differential equation, typically the continuity equations and the Navier-Stokes equations, using the uh, constitutive equations. And after that, we'll integrate, and then we'll take boundary conditions. So, sorry, we'll have constants. And these constants have to be solved as in any, in any partial differential equation problem by means of the boundary conditions. So what are the boundary conditions? Well, let, let's, let's review these boundary conditions. So the main unknown that we have in this problem is velocity, velocity density. That's the main unknown, right? Velocity and density, then stresses. But once we know stresses, we know velocity, we know stresses. So the boundary conditions should be in, in velocities. The simplest one is that in several portions of the boundary of the problem they're going to solve, look, I don't need to emphasize, but I will do, that we are going to do in spatial description. So what we will, in a typical problem of fluid mechanics, we'll have a control volume, some fixed portion of the space where the fluid is. Different particles are occupying this boundary, this volume control, and then, and then we want to know what happens at every time inside this boundary control. So for instance, we'll have just the, the, a, a, volume, a, control, a volume of control like that, okay? And then we'll solve the partial differential equations inside, and then we obtain some constants that we want to identify through boundary conditions, typically. The velocity maybe is assumed to be known, to be prescribed, to be known by a certain value v bar at some part of the boundary that is called gamma v, okay? Like it happened in solids. In solids, we call these boundary conditions gamma u, remember? Gamma u. So here is gamma v, where we know, or we assume known, the boundary, the, the, the velocities. There is something which is typical of fluids. In general, it can happen that part, part of the boundary of the control volume is impervious. What does impervious mean? Impermeable, impermeable. That it cannot be, it cannot be uh, trespassed by the particles. So particles inside cannot move outside. What is the tr translation of this condition in terms of our problem? The velocity, which can be ever any in the sense of the uh, uh, in, in the interior of the uh, control volume. Uh, in that specific boundaries have to be tangent, tangent. Because otherwise, if it was not tangent, there will be some normal component and that would translate into particles in one time inside, will move to outside in next time. So that condition is that the velocity times the normal is equal to zero. Well, to, be, to do it more general, imagine that even this impact has to make the, the more general case that this boundary this impervious boundary, walls, the walls of the problem, just move at some velocity b star. So then the impervious condition is that the relative velocity of the particles with respect to the boundary has, is tangent to the relative velocity, is tangent to the boundary. So if n is the normal to the boundary, the condition is b minus the boundary velocity that's the relative velocity times n is equal to zero and all points where this impervious boundary condition apply. Okay, that's the second condition. We'll see that we'll apply that. In fact, you have already some experience of that. Remember in chapter five, when we solved problems uh, of, of pipes, we already uh, have, have uh, imposed these conditions. Okay, however, I mean, what does that mean? That velocity in that case, that in that case, the velocity, I mean, uh, even at the boundaries is not zero. But let's think in a very viscous fluid. If the fluid is not perfect, I recall that perfect means, perfect means 
Perfect means that it's non-viscous, no viscosity. So if it's viscous, then that condition is which says that the tangent velocity is zero is replaced by a stronger version. Which one? Well, if, this, if, if we want to consider the, the, the real viscous flow, then many times we assume that the velocity, the particles with, due to viscosity at there get, get uh, sticked to the, uh, to the boundary, OK? So then the condition is not that the relative velocity is 0. It is, it is the normal com, uh, component of the, no, of the tangent velo of the relative velocity is 0, <coughs> but the total relative velocity is 0. Okay? And then, of course, there is a rapid, a very fast transition from this to a different from 0 transition. That is one of the problems that many times have to be solved in fluid mechanics, which is the the boundary layer. So that boundary layer, in general, has a rapid transition for viscous fluid from zero to some different from zero uh, velocity in a very thin layer. And that is one of the difficulties that are inherent to these uh, fluid mechanics. But anyway, in these cases, to, to, to be strict, uh, the, the velocity equal to zero or the relative velocity Equal, equal the same of the particles just at the boundary. So the particles are supposed to get stuck in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the barrier boundaries and follow the, 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 the wall, so to speak. Of course, we can have also some cases, not so normal, but in which, as it happened in solids, we have some forces acting on some boundaries. That would be gamma sigma boundaries. In solids, you remember, we had that the sigma times n, which is a traction vector, then took some typical value that was supposed known. The most common case in fluid mechanics is the case in which only one part of the traction is supposed to know. What part? The one due to the pressure. Sometimes we'll impose that the pressure, which is not the full, the full um, traction vector, but part of it, is imposed, is known, is known in the boundary, in a prescribed boundary. This is already, we have, we have applied that sometimes. When we say, for instance, uh, that, that in free surfaces, the pressure is equal to the atmospherical pressure. When two different fluids, air and water, are in contact, we assume that the pressure at the layer which is in contact, uh, or which de determines the, 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 the boundary of the fluid and the boundary of the air, that in that surface, we assume that the pressure is the same. And that pressure is something which is known, physically known, which is the uh, atmospherical pressure. OK? That's another question. And then, of course, we can have, as in, it happened in solids, mixed boundary conditions where some components, for instance, here in a pipe, in the entrance of a pipe in the entry section or out, uh, outgoing section or section cross section of a pipe, what we normally uh, suppose we assume that the unknown is the normal velocity, okay? But we know that the pressure, the tangent velocity is zero, but the pressure is known, and that used to be the uh, atmospheric pressure. So you're already familiar with that. OK. There is one specific that is interested, interesting with us. The boundary conditions on free surfaces. Look, in our, in civil engineering, in general, we deal with free surfaces. Free surfaces are those which are in contact with air. When do we have those? For instance, in a reservoir, the, the upper part of the, of the fluid is in contact with the air. This is a free surface. OK, another one, in canals. In canals, the upper part of the water in the canal then is uh, in contact with air. So it's a free surface. And then another one, in, in ocean engineering. Which one? Well, the surface 
of the sea, which is not flat, which is not flat, is a waving shaped surface that is in contact with the Earth. So that is a free surface too. And you know, in many, maybe you will, will take, I'm sure you will take some subjects on ocean engineering, there is the wave theory. The wave theory is the one that the civil engineers use to determine which is the height, the height of the, of the, of the uh, waves to design protection in harbors against, 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 against the waves. So, I mean, that's, there is a theory of fluid mechanics that deals with wave theory, how to determine the propagation and the magnitude <coughs> of waves to, typically, in terms of the wind direction and so on. So I'm not going to talk about that, but I want to think that in some cases we face that. And we know that there is a free surface whose equation we want to determine. So we want to determine, in taking of as reference a certain point, we want to determine what is the height of the surface, the free surface which is not flat due to the waves. So our unknown is this eta function that returns for every point x, y, and at every time t, the shape, the, 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 the elevation of the free surface. Okay, That is the starting point of the wave theory. Have you taken any wave theory, by the way? Any course on wave theory? Yeah. Yes, so you maybe remember some of these. Okay. Another point where we have free surfaces that is not known in advance. So when we have in earth dams, in earth dams, you know that we have a core which is supposed to be uh, uh, of a slow permea permeability, and then the, there is a seepage. There is a seepage of the water because this is not this is not <coughs> concrete, but this is a not so impervious uh, material, earth with some protections at the upper, the up, upstream and downstream, a core which is typically more uh, impervious. But anyway, we know that water filters, water filters and move from the upstream to the downstream. And even if we have a control, there is not, but there is a free surface and part of the, of the uh, material inside the, the dam is saturated, full of water, and part of the is dry. And that, we need different models to do that. So we need to know, one unknown is where is the position of, the free, of this free surface, okay? So that's another point, another typical, and we don't know that. We don't know that in advance. It's part of the calculus. So these free surfaces, in general, are treated using something that we, 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 we just visited in the first chapter, many weeks ago, which were the concept of material surface. Material surface are, were defined as those moving surfaces which are made all along time with the same set of particles. Remember that? And then we define that one condition for a certain function of x, y, z, and t define a free surface is that the material derivative of this free surface is zero. So the local derivative past the convective derivative. You remember that? So let's apply that to the case of waving, for instance. Eta is the function defining the wave elevation. Is the function defining the wave elevation. So then, since these wave elevations, assuming, and that is quite physically meaningful, assuming that the waves are made by the same particles. Have you thought about that sometime? So, that is not, waves are the same particles that move a long time. But typically, it's a reasonable assumption that, w that the all particles on the top of, 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 a, of, a, of a surf of the, of the sea are always the same. <coughs> no, it's not maybe exact, of course. But it's a reasonable assumption. So a typical assumption is that the t this equation, this eta, is such that defi it defines a, a, a material surface. So it has to fulfill that equation. 
What is the equation for this specific case? Well, derivative of phi with respect to t is derivative of, of eta with respect to t, plus b gradient of phi. b is bx, bi with z, multiply of gradient of phi. Derivative of phi with respect to x is minus derivative of theta with respect to x, with respect to y. And derivative of this function with respect to z is 1. So this term is 1. So finally, from this material surface condition, we obtain that the velocity z, the velocity z is not any. There is a condition in the velocity z. What is that? The velocity z depends. The velocity, the vertical velocity, depends on that equation eta, eta so the wave, wave height at every time, the wave height derivatives, and the velocities bx and by. So this, again, is a very specific boundary condition that is, play, is applied in wave theory as the boundary conditions for the fluid mechanics problem. OK? And finally, another condition that we, we have applied and will apply to, the condition that how do we identify, how do we identify typically a free boundary, a free surf, a free boundary. Well, if the, that free boundary is in contact with air, what can we say about the pressure, for instance, at the top of the sea surface? Zero. The atmospherical pressure would be zero. And then imagine that we solve the problem, and we know what is the pressure all in all in all points of the fluid. How do we identify which points of the space are occupied by the free surface of the fluid? By identifying as those points whose pressure is the atmospheric pressure. So that is the way that many times we identify, we'll do a problem about that, the way of identifying the free surface of a fluid in motion. Okay? Solving the pressure and then those points, those points whose pressure is equal to the atmospherical pressure, those points are the points of the free surface. When I say points, I see spatial points, because we are always assuming that we work in uh, spatial description. Okay? <coughs>